All right, well, I've already kind of done a quick introduction. My name is Calvin Hendricks Parker, and today I'm going to hopefully tell you all about uh, at least a quick introduction to some of the features of CloudFront. Don't hesitate to raise your hand and ask questions. I'll make Matt run a microphone over to you. That way we can get them recorded onto the recording. That will go up on YouTube uh, probably within the next day or so. So again, this can be pretty interactive if you guys have got questions. Putting this together, we, we use CloudFront internally at Six Feet Up for our own website and then for some of our customer projects. And I learned a ton actually throwing together this introduction uh, set of presentations. I love doing these intro talks because I always learn something when I'm, when I'm going through and doing this. So we're going to talk about basically CloudFront, which is Amazon's you know, content distribution network system. But I think before we do talk about CloudFront, we have to talk about the actual problem. I don't know if you guys can read those times up there, but we have a, a literal issue that we have to work around is when you're delivering you know, web applications or any kind of mobile apps and you're transmitting data over a network called the internet, you cannot get around the speed of light and the number of hops and the, basically the time it takes to go around the globe. Uh, you can see here that you know this was actually from my laptop this morning to these various points of presence for Amazon that obviously going to Virginia and Ohio we're looking at like 30 milliseconds super quick. But when you get down into Asia, we get into the 200 plus milliseconds, which means you're spending literally just a quarter of a second making the connection and getting back. So we need a way to work around this kind of a problem so we can speed up delivery of our applications to the rest of the world and not just into our own region. So the way we typically work around these kinds of problems is with a CDN. So a content distribution network is basically a a series of edge points on any kind of network. They're typically called points of presence, or POPs. Uh, Amazon's, in this case, has 144 different edge locations that they can help you deliver your application from. Uh, the reasons we would want to use a CDN, obviously we just talked about kind of that latency and speed when getting from one part of the network to your you know, own laptop or mobile device or wherever you're delivering an application to. But you also can reduce things like bandwidth costs, uh, we can improve page load times, and then we want to be able to increase the global availability of our content. So if we have an outage in one region, our site can actually literally still be alive someplace else because the network can route around you know, outages inside, inside of the network. Uh, Amazon is not the only CDN in town. There are many other common ones that are out there. Uh, for example, uh, Akamai is probably the, one of the older ones that I, I was aware of. Uh, Cloudflare is really popular. You've probably seen their TV commercials. I think they even had like a Super Bowl commercial. Who thought a CDN would have a Super Bowl commercial? Well, they did. And then Fastly, which is pretty heavily involved with open source, which I, I kind of like those guys as well. They're some of the people who contribute into like the Varnish project, for example. So if anybody's familiar with the server Varnish, you can use it as a caching server in front of your application. They've taken that and actually done the same kind of thing, putting it across the globe in various points of presence and giving you those edge locations where you can now cache your content and get that content closer to your end users. Now, other CDNs, uh, all the major telcos, these are actually CDNs are hiding everywhere. All the major telcos have CDNs. Uh, so if you're looking at AT&T, CenturyLink, name some big telco, they're probably also running a CDN behind the scenes for their hosting customers or delivering content. Uh, you look at groups like Netflix, they are literally taking physical hardware and dropping it in ISPs around the country to get you your Netflix movies closer to you so they aren't paying all the bandwidth transit charges and having those things just cache once locally to an ISP and then delivered out to your you know, set-top box or your phone or wherever you're, you're viewing that those movies. That's another kind of CDN. There's lots of free CDNs out there. Uh, there is a free tier for the first year on Amazon's uh, CloudFront. Cloudflare has a free tier. If you actually aren't doing a lot of you know, fancy stuff, you can use a lot of these tools for nearly no cost. Uh, and there's other ones like Bootstrap CDN and uh, JS Deliver, which allow you to uh, deliver certain parts of your application. So you're using Bootstrap JS or various JavaScript libraries. Google and numerous others have basically produced some public URLs that your application can use embedded in your web pages to take advantage of their CDNs while you're delivering your web, your web application. And those are typically no cost to you. But why would you want to use CloudFront specifically? And I found this quite interesting because at first when I approached CloudFront, I was really just thinking of it as another CDN where I'm going to cache my content, get it 
distribute it out to those points of presence so that I have faster response times around the network. But there's actually a lot more compelling reasons to use CloudFront if you're in AWS already. Uh, some of the big ones are the fact that it is tightly integrated with a lot of the AWS services. So you actually can quickly integrate CloudFront right in front of your existing applications that are using an ELB or an ALB or EC2. Uh, you can actually set up origins, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, on S3. So you can deliver static websites straight out of S3 through CloudFront and get the resources then cached globally, which is really handy. And I'll show you an example of how we did that with a, another custom origin combined with an S3 origin. Uh, you can do things like authorize the access via signed URLs and cookies. So if you actually have, want to distribute, maybe someone is buying downloadable media from you, and you still want to be able to distribute that you know, song or book or movie over the CDN, but you don't want people to be able to share those URLs and have access to it you know, freely. Maybe they had to purchase it, and then they get a specific URL sent to them in an email. CloudFront supports signing of URLs so that you can actually verify that that person is allowed to grab content off of your content distribution network. Uh, in addition, you get additional security benefits. Um, one of the big selling points for a tool like Cloudflare has been their denial of service protection. But CloudFront also integrates with AWS Shield and AWS WAF. So if you guys aren't familiar with the Shield product and the WAF product from Amazon, Shield's like a layer two, layer three DDoS type protection. And uh, WAF gives you that layer seven application protection for your uh, web application. So you can protect against things like um, uh, SQL, SQL injection attacks or common like injection attacks into your web applications. And then lastly, the CloudFront has a full compliance uh, already baked in. So if you're doing PCI or HIPAA or any of these other standards that are up there, from Amazon's standpoint, CloudFront is already certified from the infrastructure and their process levels underneath each of these various certifications. So then your responsibility is just going to be at your applications level to also comply with those certifications. But Amazon, you can kind of be assured that Amazon has already complied with those pieces on their side. So it kind of gets back to that shared security model. They also have that kind of a shared compliance model, I guess, that you can use now knowing that you have those certifications under your belt. So when you're using CloudFront, you typically will deploy what they call a distribution. So if you log into the AWS control panel, you'll go into the CloudFront area, you will then add a new distribution. So for each site you want to deploy, you create a distribution, and those distributions will have origins and behaviors and that you can configure for each of your applications. So each distribution can have you know, custom domain names. So if you want to have www.sixfeet.com be delivered straight out of CloudFront, you can actually assign that underneath the domain names. Uh, so kind of this is a, just a screenshot of the main distribution of one of our CloudFront distributions for actually our, I think it's our testing website. Right now we do have a custom domain name on this one. It's awstesting.sixfeet.com. Uh, CloudFront does support WebSockets. So if you do want to create WebSocket persistent connections, uh, CloudFront will pass those back through to your application as long as your application is speaking uh, WebSockets on the back end. So you don't have to worry about whether it you know, can pass that through or not. Uh, it does allow for things like origin groups. So you will have typically multiple origins or a single origin behind your CloudFront, which is the source of your content that's being de delivered for your web application. If you set up an origin group, if that first server is down, it can actually automatically fail over and request content from that secondary server. So you, instead of serving up an error page, it can actually do some amount of failover for you automatically without giving the end user any kind of indication that something you know, was amiss on the back end. So if you get a 500 error or some kind of a 400 error, it can actually retry against the other origins in that origin group. You can do streaming, so RTMP, uh, you can do uh, various streaming media types through, this, through the site. Uh, you can also set up custom origins, so you don't have to necessarily be using Amazon's, uh, rest of Amazon's features, so you don't have to be on EC2 or ALB or S3. You can literally have CloudFront in front of your existing web application no matter where it's hosted. Uh, origins can literally just be a URL to someplace else, uh, much in the way Cloudflare does that, where Cloudflare doesn't necessarily, well, they do now, but they didn't used to just offer hosting for your code you can now actually run your application in your own private data center, but leverage the CDN of CloudFront as a custom origin. 
Another nice feature is HTTP, HTTP2, and I will show you a little bit about that in a second. Uh, that's really nice to be able to support HTTP2 because you get a lot faster downloads since it can actually pipeline everything, well, not pipeline, but throw everything together in one connection in one socket instead of having to split it up into chunks. And I'll show you some uh, performance advantages of that. Getting started with the custom domain names is actually pretty easy. You can either use Route 53, and then you can basically tell your CloudFront distribution, uh, this is my Route 53 domain or URL or canonical uh, domain name that I'm using for that site. If you aren't using Route 53, like for example, we don't use Route 53 for our own site. So if you go to 60up.com right now, that is delivered over CloudFront, but we're not using Route 53 for the DNS information. So we actually had to go in and make A records for each of the uh, servers that are involved in our distribution. So that's easy to find out. You just do a, a DNS lookup on whatever the custom or whatever the uh, CloudFront URL is. It will give you back a list of all the IP addresses. Then you can make your own uh, A records for each of them in there, and then it'll act just as if you were using Route 53. You just kind of lose some of the configurability and, and ease of customization, program programmability of using Route 53 with CloudFront if you do it this way. But it does work. Uh, it is recommended to use Route 53, so if you're already using that, you're all set. You just basically point it at your Route 53 record. Yeah. Uh, they have not changed on us. I believe once you have a distribution in place, they don't change, do they? Oh, yeah, so, or I can get Matt to give you the, the mic next time. The question was, will these IP addresses change? Uh, we've been running for almost a year now. These, I don't think these change. Once you have a distribution in place, those IP addresses are kind of bound to your domain name that's on that, that distribution. Unlike if you restart an EC2 instance and your public IP can change unless you reserve specifically an elastic IP. Uh, and again, if, if you're using Route 53, that all gets handled for you, but I think you're pretty safe doing this technique. I think that's even in the documentation like this. So once you serve up the site using a custom domain name like we are, uh, this is a little small to read, but you'll see that all the URLs, all this is a Firefox open with a developer toolbar. On the screen, you can see the uh, domain for all of ours is coming from sixfeetup.com. And if you were to be able to read the, the headers part of that over there, you would actually see that it was a, delivered from CloudFront. Uh, it gives you a lot of nice headers uh, when you do the request. You can debug if there's any kind of issues or if you need to do tracing. There's typically a CloudFront ID in the headers on the response. So if you needed to actually, if you're doing logging, which you have to configure separately, uh, you can actually log out to S3 and then actually parse your logs and do tracing against the headers, finding those kinds of IDs in there. You also get some other you know, debugging information, like whether it was a hit or a miss, you know, kind of standard stuff for when debugging uh, web caches. But in this case, our whole site is being served up as a in the distribution from CloudFront. Now, the benefit we get is if you go to webpagetest.org, which is like my kind of de facto standard for doing a quick you know, gut check of whether the site's performing well or not, you can pretty well expect to get a is across the board. Uh, the last C right there is because we have 24 hour uh, expiration times on some of our static resources that I've just not had, I mean like 24 hours, I'm like, all right, if you request it once a day, I'm totally cool with that, I'm not gonna go in and fix it yet. But then you get the nice, uh, I don't know why they have a hand-drawn check mark on their UI, but you do get the nice effective use of CDN. Now you can see in that first run, that the, down at the very bottom of the slide, you'll see the very first run took two point, I think to the fully loaded was 3.3 seconds. Uh, now you'll see there were 102 requests. On the second run with a prime cache, we still do leverage a lot of caching on the browser. We're only downloading 25 resources for a grand total of about 159 kilobytes of information. So the second load is incredibly fast. Uh, so you can see we, we, we shaved off a few, um, maybe a second or a little less off of our load time by leveraging browser caches as well. But the, the, the time to first byte is very good, you know, 123 milliseconds uh, for a full web application. Uh, I believe this was, you know, with a clear cache and then the second repeat run was with a prime cache on the browser. Uh, here's another example of using CloudFront. In this case, we are not deploying the main application behind CloudFront but we're actually deploying all the static resources. So if you actually wanted to only deploy your static resources and make sure that they are globally available, it's very possible to do a hybrid type situation with CloudFront. 
you'll see that the very first domain up there is uh, workplacecai.com. But every other, every other URL for all the static resources, like the Bootstrap and all the JavaScript, all the CSS coming in, are coming in from a cloudfront.net URL with a custom hash at the very beginning of it. So that's actually the URL directly to our distribution. We didn't put a custom domain name on it. And there are, if you want, want to do this, it's very easy to deploy. Those resources are actually being delivered out of an S3 backend. And we have, a, this is a Django application. We're using the, if you guys are familiar with Django, there's a cookie cutter template for Django that allows you to pretty much automatically deploy your static resources into S3. If you just say yes to an answer um, when you're kind of doing the initial skeleton of your project. If you didn't start with the cookie cutter template, you can actually go back and kind of look at their documentation for how to set this up. But basically it uses an alternate storage to put in static resources and the content resources, kind of much in the same way as like a WordPress site. Instead of storing them locally on the, the VM or the application server where the Django app's actually running, we store them in S3, and then I expose that S3 bucket to our CloudFront distribution to then cache those resources at all the points of presence. And one thing to be you know, kind of clear about when you're talking about the CloudFront uh, edge locations, CloudFront does not push your content out to those edge locations. Those edge locations will request that content when they are being requested. So if a visitor in Asia request this site, if those objects don't exist in an edge location near that visitor, there'll be a cache miss, they'll go back to the origin, which in this case will be S3, to grab that resource. In our, in our case, we have all the, the S3 bucket is located in Virginia. It will then cache that request over in that edge location, and any subsequent requests from Asia will now get the cached copy from that edge location directly. So the first request may take 200 milliseconds to to get the data into the cache, but subsequent requests will be under 100 milliseconds, you know, 30, 40 milliseconds, because they're gonna get it from a, a direct location next to them. So as long as one person, you know, whatever the cache, because you also set up caching rules here, how long you want ca uh, CloudFront to hold on to each of these items. In our case, we typically use uh, cache busting techniques on our CSS and JavaScripts, so we can cache these for a super long time into CloudFront if we want to, because subsequent requests for updated versions of the application will actually write out new URLs, and we don't have to worry about getting these old ones. They can, they'll, just, they'll just age out in the cache, and we don't care. That way we can keep sure, we're, we are ensuring we're always serving the latest version of the CSS and JavaScripts to our end users by using tools like uh, Grunt and Gulp and Webpack to write out those URLs for us into our application. Another thing to note here is this application is being served completely over HTTP2. And if you look at the very first set of like I don't know, 20 or so resources, you'll see that they all, they all have a first byte and request time almost like simultaneously. You know, prior to HTTP2, when we were using HTTP 1.1, it used to be really, really impossible to do this because web browsers could only make a maximum of four requests uh, in the pipeline at once. So you'd kind of see these chunks of like four, and then four, and then four, and then four, which meant you really wanted to reduce the number of requests your website had to make to get a, a fast delivery, because you just had this kind of built-in limitation of being able to do only four things at once. With HTTP2, you, you work around that now. It opens up a, a socket directly to the CloudFront server or to your application, and then sends all the data right straight down it without having to do that chunking by four. So you get a huge, you get a really big speed performance increase if you can switch your applications just over to HTTP2 alone. Do nothing else other than switch to HTTP2 and you, you get this speed boost, which is really nice. Uh, so that's our custom DNS, custom, yeah, so you're seeing here CloudFront URLs being served up as resources for this Workplace Courage Axe Index site. Now to make that work, I'm gonna show you how that's all set up on the back end. Uh, so the very th first thing you're going to set up on your CloudFront back distribution backend is going to be the origin. This is like the source of the content where you're going to be serving those files up from. So generally, you, you can be as simple as having one, one origin backend. It could be the current web server that's hosting your site. You would set up an origin. In this case, we have, uh, this is the Six Feet Up uh, site, so we're, we're skipping back to the sixfeetup.com site. We have one EC2 instance, or no, sorry, we have a, a load balancer, an ELB load balancer with two EC2 instances behind it, and we set up our origin to point directly at the ELB that's hosting our load balance site. And since Cl CloudFront's integrated with all the uh, AWS technologies, that's very easy because basically you get a drop down, you pick your load balancer, 
and it knows where everything's at. You don't have to worry about IP addresses and worry about IP addresses changing because CloudFront will keep track of all those things on the back end as Amazon changes that stuff for you. You'll see the origin type here is a custom origin. So it's not S3, it's not a media server, it's, it's not one of the other types of, uh, of origins. And we also have a backend protocol of H HTTP only. So we do our HTTPS termination at CloudFront, which means we can actually distribute all of our HTTPS termination to all those edge locations. You get an immediate speed up there as well. That you know, setup and teardown of the connections is now managed by AWS's CloudFront infrastructure and not our own web servers. Uh, they've got this thing highly tuned to be able to do those things very, very quickly. Uh, and then on the back side, we just use HTTP. Now, if you do need a uh, like fully, fully encrypted bridge between your uh, web browser to CloudFront to the backend server, you can do that as well. And you can actually have a hybrid of those as well. And I'll show that in a minute. You can do both half and full bridge HTTPS with uh, separate origins, one HTTP, one HTTPS, and then you can use what's called behaviors to choose which, which URLs go over which of those backends, or say origins. Now for the workplace site, we did use S3 to store all of our content, the, all the static resources for that content. The trick there is being able to go from users through CloudFront to S3, you don't want users to be able to access the S3 bucket directly, necessarily. You may be using things like the signed URLs or signed cookies to protect access to those S3 objects directly. So what you can do is you can set up a OAI, which is an object access identifier, and that will actually allow CloudFront to authenticate to S3 and allow specific access to specific buckets. And so you can tightly control your S3 bucket still and not risk having a, a bucket open to the world, which now gets you, lands you on Hacker News immediately. Uh, to do that, you set up a, a custom, another origin. You'll see this origin type is S3 in this case. So we have an S3 bucket on the back end. You see the origin access, I'm sorry, the origin access identity that has been set up on this one. And uh, that is, if you see over here on the security down the, the left-hand side, there's a security section. That first one is the origin access identity. When you set up a CloudFront distribution, if you select an S3 bucket as your origin, it will automatically prompt you to set up a new OAI. So this is actually pretty, pretty point and click if you're doing it through the UI, through the, the web console. It will automatically create the OAI for you. It will automatically create over on the S3 bucket the uh, ACL on the bucket for that OAI. So basically you'll see a big long string, you know, it's a unique identifier for this CloudFront distribution to identify itself to the S3 bucket and actually grant read, write, read and write access to the bucket if you want. Now there's one more tricky piece to setting it up this way, and I'll go over that in just a second, only because we're not using a custom domain name with our CloudFront distribution, we're using the cloudfront.net uh, URL, and I'll show you how that works. So on the back end, you choose what goes over to what origin using behaviors. So behaviors, you can just think of them as uh, ways you can select you know, which path, which URL, which cookies, which headers, select what origin is gonna deliver your site. So in the most basic use case, you always have a default behavior which has a you know, asterisk that basically globs everything. So it's kind of the catch-all for any requests coming in through your CloudFront distribution and then sends the request to whatever backend. You can see there the origin is listed. You can have multiple, multiple behaviors pointing to different origins based on whatever criteria you have. You can even do, I'll show you how you can do that with the Lambda at Edge to make decisions on which origin actually should serve up requests based on even content uh, in the request itself. Now the tricky bit I was mentioning is this cross-origin request uh, sharing. Has anyone had to deal with this before? Once you do, you like know it, you're like, oh, okay, that's not so bad. The first time you hit it, you're like, oh my God, why are my fonts not loading? I don't understand, like, I'm not getting my, my awesome icon, fav, you know, fav, favicons and fav icons. So what happens is because my static resources, the fonts, the CSS, the JavaScript, are all being served from the domain cloud, uh, cloudfront.net and not from workplacecai.com, uh, the browser is gonna complain about that, especially in all the modern browsers right now, especially Firefox and, and Chrome. They're not gonna allow that. So you'll get you know, broken images when it can't load a, a specific font or broken text when it can't load a specific font. When you actually create a behavior, and in this case, we have the origin set up to be the S3 bucket. Uh, we also can set up uh, things, for example, like redirect HTTP to HTTPS so we can enforce HTTPS for everything. 
At the very bottom, you can also whitelist certain headers to pass back through. So normally, you want to be very picky about which headers you pass through, because that will affect the cacheability of certain uh, objects in the, the actual CloudFront cache. But in this case, you'll see that the red text at the very bottom gives you a warning. If you are indeed passing back to an S3 bucket and not using custom uh, URL or custom domain names on that bucket, you will want to set up this cross-origin uh, resource sharing policy. And you will need to pass back these three specific headers. And this is all in the AWS docs. It's not a big mystery, but you have to be aware that you have to do this or else you'll have broken images in, the, in your site. Which thing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the first time I ran into this, I was like, oh, I don't know what's going on here. But yeah, you, basically if you could pass these headers back, S3 will then read in those specific headers and then put a policy onto the objects being sent back out through CloudFront so that your web browser will say, yes, this is valid, allowed behavior. And what that looks like is you have to go in and do a cores configuration underneath the permissions and you basically paste in there what the allowed origin is. In this case, I put the testing website up there, so testing-workplace CAI, and then you tell it which methods are allowed to happen on these resources in this bucket. Otherwise, uh, S3 won't serve them up and the browser won't allow you to display them because it thinks you might be trying to do something sneaky. But it's pretty simple to set up once you've kind of got that all, all in place. So as an example of actually, you can set up multiple origins. In this case, the dash boxes on the right are your different origins. One's an S3, one's maybe uh, EC2 hosting up a WordPress site. If you had all of your static content and your includes coming from the S3 bucket, and you had the rest of it being served up from the load balancer and WordPress site, you would set up, in this case, you could set up four different behaviors you know, to match these various URLs. The default is your fall through catch all, so everything else that doesn't match WP content or WP includes is going to get served by the EC2 instance automatically. Now, you could do things in this case if you wanted to have the login page always be secure all the way back to the origin. If you had a third behavior in there and a second, a third origin where the load balancer was terminating HTTPS, you can support HTTP and HTTPS simultaneously and ensure that logins are always encrypted in transit no matter whether they're inside the AWS network or outside the AWS network. Now probably one of the most I don't know, interesting things you can do with CloudFront is this Lambda Edge. I have not done any of these things yet, but if you are doing Lambda and serverless and you actually want to be able to put that compute at the actual edges of this CloudFront network, so have it running at 144 different places on the globe, you can push uh, triggers to CloudFront, you know, either requests or responses on the, from the viewer or from the origin, out to those edge locations. So you can do things like inspecting cookies, rewriting requests. You can even make network calls from that Lambda to a DynamoDB database and do lookups dynamically for things like redirects. Uh, you can then, uh, now as of August, you have access to the request body. So before when requests were coming in, you would have access to cookies and headers, but now you can actually request or have access to a certain portion, like they'll truncate it at a certain size, but actually make decisions on, in the request body, do I need to do some kind of action on this request, change the result, uh, change the response, or you know, do some other kind of custom operation. Uh, the issue, you know, for kind of some of the limitations, it's not fully like Lambda, it's very close. Uh, right now, the, all the Lambda Edge has to be done in Node.js. Uh, there are a couple other limitations. There's no dead letter queue, there's no environment variables like they have in Lambda right now, and you also can't access resources in, in VPCs. So if you have stuff that's publicly available, those can be accessible. So like, for example, DynamoDB databases, uh, if you want to actually do things like have a, have a contact form on your site or a beacon on your site and have edge locations actually handle the, the handling of that form data uh, as it's being sent back in. Now, it's a little pricey compared to Lambda. Hey, who in the room is already using Lambda for serverless? Okay, so the standard pricing for Lambda is like 20 cents per 1 million invocations of your Lambda function. Lambda at Edge is about 200% more expensive. It's like 60 cents. I don't know, 200% sounds dramatic, but 60 cents per 1 million invocations of your Lambda at Edge function. And then the duration costs are also uh, similarly scaled. Uh, you get charged for the duration of your Lambda function running. 
in Lambda Edge, you also get charged about 200% more for that duration it's running, and you're also limited to only 128 megabytes of total RAM. So these are meant to be very, very fast, very, very small. You know, think of it as writing like a redirector or a context form handler pushes it into Dynamo. These are not meant to be big, long-running applications at these edge nodes. They're very different than kind of the standard serverless uh, lambdas we're, we're kind of used to at this point. Some other use cases for the Lambda at Edge. Uh, I already mentioned like being able to do 301s and 302s. You can greatly speed up your application by having those redirects happen at those edge locations. So instead of having to come all the way back to your origin server, figure out that there was actually a redirect supposed to happen, if you can feed that information into like a DynamoDB database that can now be multi-mastered across multiple regions, you can now have that lookup happen very, very close to those end users and greatly speed them up getting to the pages they're wanting to be. So that has an overall improvement in their perceived speed. Uh, you can do things like origin failover. So if one origin isn't responding, you can make decisions on what to serve up instead, whether you want to serve up a, an error response or try a different origin or some other kind of dynamic behavior there. Uh, other examples are you know, a contact form, being able to post it in DynamoDB, or gathering web beacon data. So if you've got mobile users and you want to be able to quickly process that data very, very fast, you don't want to have to wait for them if they're all the way across the planet, 200 milliseconds, you know, 250 milliseconds round trip just for the, the connection alone could be you know, um, not good for your own application depending on what it is. You can put up to four trigger events, or no, I take that back. There is a limit of 100 trigger events per CloudFront distribution, and you can have a maximum of 25 distributions in your account with uh, triggers or Lambda at Edge triggers on them. There are diff four different events you can act on, which is things like the viewer requesting something, the origin requesting something, so from CloudFront to the, to the origin server, then the responses, response from the origin, response to the, the end user. So any of those four activities can trigger your Lambda to run and do some kind of operation against that request or response. Not only do you get awesome like caching and the speed ups of your site, but you do get some pretty cool reports just out of the box. Like this is all built in and baked into Lambda itself. Or not Lambda, sorry, CloudFront. This is still a CloudFront talk. Uh, you get things like uh, re total re uh, hits, requests, misses, you know, full kind of analytics running against your site or against the, uh, the CloudFront distributions themselves. You also get things like status codes, uh, if there are errors, you can then filter those errors out and find out if there's problems in the application or if you're seeing people who are trying to hit your site, you know, with malicious type uh, URLs, you could then start putting in behaviors to direct those malicious URLs to other places or WAF policies uh, layered on top of your distribution to handle that. You can set up alarms, so if certain thresholds, like for example, if you see 400 errors, like 404s or 401s, if you start seeing the percentage of those errors rise to a certain threshold, it can then send a, a notification to an SNS topic to alert you that you need, maybe need to take action or have some to other tool inside your infrastructure take action for you. And then popular object reports. So you may want to see, dive deeper into those numbers and see what they actually mean. Here you can actually see what things are popular, hits, misses, you know, how many times they're happening, whether you're seeing um, incomplete downloads from the back end. So you can see that our main like slash had 33 incomplete downloads. You may want to look into your own logs on the back end to see if there was some kind of issue or some kind of connectivity problem. It can help you alert you of other kinds of prob other issues. You get other reports uh, such as refers, uh, viewers, so like devices, browsers, operating systems, countries, and then your actual usage, like number of requests. Since you are billed per request, I mean, you get millions of requests for a small amount of money, but you still can track that and see you know, how, how long your requests are taking, how much data you're transmitting, how much data you're saving not going to your origin is also an interesting number to track there. What's kind of cool with CloudFront, if, because it is tracking things like devices and browsers, your Lambda at Edge functions have that data available to them, so they, you, don't have, you can do content negotiation. So if you detect someone's coming from a specific kind of device or a specific kind of browser, you can actually make decisions at the CloudFront edges about where to get that data from. There are some sample deployments. If you guys have not checked out the AWS samples repository or organization on GitHub, there are some reference architecture ones for Drupal, Moodle, and WordPress up there. So I'm not a PHP guy. I can't help you much other than pointing you at them. But they do include cloud formation templates that will set up these pretty robust um, reference implementations for basically a zero downtime, high, highly available, uh, fully CDN-backed 
a deployment of your WordPress tool. I make no guarantees of what your bill may be after you press one of these buttons. So do that at your own own uh, own pleasure. Uh, these slides will be available. Actually, these slides are already up in our Indie AWS GitHub repository. So if you guys haven't been there, but we have a GitHub repository. These uh, the text file of all these links, all that stuff's already up on on GitHub right now. <clears throat> Another big benefit to using CloudFront is going to be its security model. Uh, you do have the OAI, so you can protect your S3 buckets and still access them from CloudFront distributions. Another cool feature that I saw was uh, not used is field level encryption. So if you're actually posting forms back through a CloudFront distribution, CloudFront can take a public key that you upload to it and encrypt specific fields one by one to the you know, form encoded data that's in the post and then forward that back to your uh, origin servers. And then the origin servers, are hopefully they have the private key so they can decrypt that information. No, not necessarily. Yeah, no, the, the, this can be any you know, public key you upload to that specific control panel for doing the, the public key part for the encrypted field level encryption. Okay. <clears throat> it does integrate with the uh, AWS certificate manager, so it means that certificate manager can renew the SSL certificates that are on your distributions. You can combine that with your ELBs. So if you want to have a full bridge HTTPS managed so that the certificates are automatically renewed for you, the ACM does that. As using CloudFront, you get automatically the AWS Shield standard, which is pretty much the basic DDoS uh, protection and not the $3,000 a month, one year minimum required commitment to do the AWS Shield advanced. But it's definitely helpful because the Shield will deploy countermeasures to common DDoS attacks to their edge locations, so that traffic never actually hits your origin service at all. So it's a great way to protect your, your application. You have the option of using WAF. Uh, WAF isn't free, you pay per rule, and you, you pay uh, per data that goes through the rule. I think that's what it is. Yeah, WAF has a, a 60 cents per million requests and a dollar per rule. So WAF has a similar pricing to the AWS at, at, uh, AWS at Edge, um, the Lambda at Edge. Uh, feature is about same pricing, 60 cents per million requests. But you can do things, in this case, if you, I've got some samples right here, there's AWS samples, the WAF sample. That has, for example, policies in there for the common OWASP 10, top 10 vulnerabilities, SQL injection, you name it. You can go deploy those, and then if people would attempt those types of attacks against your website, the CloudFront edge nodes would reject that traffic before it ever got back to your origins. Uh, so here's an example of using that AWS Certificate Manager, having it actually manage the certificates on CloudFront and the ELB, so you can have HTTP access into S, uh, S3 buckets and HTTP access into your load balancer on the back end. So what does this all cost? Uh, you basically pay for data transfer out. You do not pay for transfer from CloudFront to your origins if they are inside AWS. So you can save money on transfer there, uh, if you had a lot of transfer going into your origins. Uh, you pay per HTTP, HTTP requests. Uh, you will pay for invalidation requests. So if you actually want to purge something from the CloudFront distribution, so if you have an object that's stale, you can send in API requests to actually purge those items out, uh, but you pay per request. And it's pretty, I mean, it's relatively inexpensive. Uh, there's some limits on the number of invalidations you can have active at any one point in time. And you can also do things like a wildcard um, invalidation, where if you want to purge the whole in, uh, distribution, that only counts as one invalidation request because you just basically purged star. Uh, what else? Your field level encryption requests, you pay for those as well. And then you pay a lot if you do a dedicated IP SSL certificate. Uh, I do not recommend that, and neither do they. Uh, this is only if you have clients or applications that don't support SNI for HTTPS uh, negotiation which means running basically multiple SSL certificates or HTTPS certificates on one IP address. So if you have to have a dedicated IP address, you will pay, I think, like $600 a month. Uh, basically, they don't want you to do that. That's what they're charging you for is don't do that. There's some more links up here for the documentation. The developer guide is very, very helpful. The 
uh, contents of the developer guide is actually available uh, under a Creative Commons share like license and is available on GitHub for pull requests. And there's some pretty good ones in there. So for example, the one thing I've not mentioned to you is if you make an invalidation request or if you make a change to your distribution, be prepared to wait 20 to 30 minutes for that change to propagate to all 144 locations around the globe. It is not a fast process by any means. And probably one of the funniest pull requests I saw was the guy who put a pull request in to make that documentation change because they were optimistic and said, oh, 10 to 15 minutes. I don't think anyone in this room has ever seen a distribution update in 10 to 15 minutes. And Amazon accepted the request and now the documentation reflects it appropriately. Uh, and then the API reference. So if you are using uh, Bado or Python or any other kind of standard uh, AWS APIs, it is fully programmatic. You can control every aspect of the CloudFront distributions from your code or your application. And that's what I got. If you guys got any questions, I am happy to answer them.